Depending on your gaming habits and how much you're willing to admit, you've likely encountered alcohol in some form, either in game or in real life, while playing video games. Let's be honest, have you had multiple bottles of Arcadia Merlot just because? You really didn't need that extra health boost, did you? Have you had one too many drinks and found yourself stumbling out of the saloon? Speaking of saloons, pubs, bars, taverns, cafes, how many role-playing games can you think of that have important plot points that take place in such establishments? Did you just complete a level, finish the race, congratulations, pop off the cork of that champagne and have a drink? Princess Peach certainly does, but only in the Japanese version. <laughs> And we're not fooled, we all know that Soda Popinski is really Vodka Drunkinski, and that Chrono's Soda Pop Guzzling Contest might be a questionable activity for a young adventurer. Let's not forget that in this game also involves a soup drinking contest, or if you've played the DS version, you drink Skull Crushers instead. Later in the same game, you also pay your respects to Toma, a tavern frequenting adventurer by pouring pop, or liquor or sake, depending on the translation, onto his gravestone. References to alcohol and other substances are frequent in video games. It is very easy to find online videos discussing alcoholic references in games, or drunk gamers streaming games, or drunk gamers discussing alcohol in games while streaming games. And of course, while these are fairly amusing examples, I do want to be clear from the beginning that alcohol and substance abuse is not funny for a lot of people, uh, and I in no way intend to be flippant uh, about the subject. So to get started, I actually want to mention two recent studies that are concerned with the presence and use of alcohol in video games and their influence on teens and preteens. In her chapter on health hazards, and health hazards and promoters in games, Cheryl Olson notes differences between the two game rating systems of North America and Europe. The ESRB uses 30 content descriptors, three of which mention alcohol, while the European system combines alcohol and drug use under a single syringe icon. Olson warns that games might model substance use and encourage children to copy it. Sure enough, Joe Cranwell's research is one of the first to attempt to, uh, to attempt a focused study of the influence of video games on adolescent substance use, and points out that these rating systems may be highly flawed when it comes to the presence of substances. The study, which took place in the UK, shows that non-official sources reported that 44% of the games that they used in the study uh, included substance content, but that none of those were reported by the PEGI system. The group also argues that young people exposed to the content are more than twice as likely to have used tobacco or alcohol, although they admit that their self-reporting study needs some refinement uh, in the future. So both the armchair, game chair, online video discussions and recent scholarship on alcohol and video games primarily focuses on ideas of presence, exposure, portrayal, use, and salience but with a clear bias toward the visual. My take on analysis of the presence of alcohol in video games, however, is that it should include both the visual and the audio, so my hope for today's presentation will lay some basic groundwork for examining sounds related to alcohol in various forms of media. Let's listen. It's not coming through, is it? Can I try another audio plug, maybe? I didn't seem to want to do HDMI. Let's try that. There it is. I hear that we work for Mr. Moontree again. Like you to the Armadillo Saloon, the finest drinking establishment in the West. Brandy will take the edge off. I get lonely. Preserve. Oh. 
<laughs> Sorry about that, old chap. <laughs> Gotta go. Although my focus today is on video games, I do try to bring in other forms uh, of media as well. I'd like to offer four areas of inquiry, and although they are certainly interrelated, I attempt to highlight specific attributes for each topic. They are sound icons, sonic environments related to alcohol, music depictions of drunkenness, and oral phenomena related to intoxication. So for the most part, sound icons related to alcohol simply refers to short oral cues, the clinking of glasses, opening of a beer bottle, gulping, vomiting, etc. Okay? But I'd like to suggest maybe three main components to this idea. The first is using real sounds uh, related to alcohol in conjunction with its use on screen. Of course, before audio technology allowed for this, sound designers had to represent these in some other way. For example, I'm actually gonna play the clip from Chrono Trigger that I alluded to earlier, in which the characters pour liquor over a grave, during which you will hear a glugging sound. So that would be a sound icon. Uh, in this instance, the audio designer had to decide what a pouring bottle would sound like. Related to this certainly is how an ROQ may undergo some sort of uh, transformation, potentially when it can become a culturally recognizable icon. Bush, as crisp and cold as a mountain stream, and has the same great taste it's always had. Even the same sound. Bush. So this clip is from Bush Beer's advertisement series, uh, which was first premiered during the 2017 Super Bowl, and it refers to the beer still having that same great sound it always did. But that same sound of Bush Beer isn't the sound of a can opening, rather it's a transformation of that sound. This is the type of audio branding that uh, Alex Newton in his 2015 dissertation would label a sonic logo. But how can we take stock of the actual transformation of something like that, some multi-part sound icon? This example shows one possibility uh, in which the actual sounds are represented vocally in the International Phonetic Alpha Alphabet. So here would be an actual sound. Which might end up then as this. And if you're actually curious about what those voiceless paloto alveolar sibilant, I can tell you about those later. So how might we be able to expand this topic if this would be expanded in some way? Sound iconography of alcohol may simply be, or involve a cataloging of sounds, although I do think specific accounts of the development of these sounds could be interesting, uh, and analysis of the content, use, and extra musical meaning of these icons uh, certainly could be explored as well. For example, one could look around at sound iconography in other forms of media, like graphic novels or comic books, and Captain Alcohol, and Iron Man, and various other things. I take the second topic that I've listed, sonic environments. Oh, that's what I wanted, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sonic environments related to alcohol, bo both as a numerous simultaneous and continuous uh, set of sound icons, as well as additional sounds of ambience, such as music or unique environmental factors. I won't play the Red Dead Redemption clip again, but you can think back to that first example, um, back to the cumulative sounds that occurred. One obvious stereotype is that of a saloon player, uh, which seems essential for any depiction of the saloon in the American West. According to ragtime pianist and historian Robert Milne, saloons and barrel houses typically had one very important rule. Don't shoot the piano player. It's bad for business. The music was an essential part of the atmosphere in order to put patrons at ease and just simply to sell more alcohol. In many games, often in role-playing games, but not always, uh, relating alcohol to a larger sonic environment mostly man itself, ma manifests itself in some form of a tavern or bar. 
And one interesting aspect to note is that some pub soundtracks are unique to a single area. That is, the only time we hear certain music is within a specific uh, area. In some RPGs, these soundtracks attempt to reflect a culture or fictional race specific to the game, which is how we end up with elven or orcish tavern music. Other musical uh, cues uh, might be the introduction of brand new music for a specific character, um, and they also might in include unique trigger music, which may be a non-essential musical cue, um, uh, but only happens uh, activated under certain circumstances. For example, in this next scene from Final Fantasy V, this is one of the few instances where we hear a Carmen-esque musical cue. As for further possibilities in this area, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention the explosion of arcade bars uh, that happens, that's happened over the past 15 years. If ever there were some opportunities for doing some field work in sound studies, alcohol, and video games, uh, these would be the places to start. Musical depictions of drunkenness differs from the previous examples in that there are specific musical decisions such as instrumentation, pitch relationships, motivic uh, or metric distortion, or some other factor that leads to a representation of someone being intoxicated. So the following example is from Warner Brothers Academy Award nominated cartoon High Note, directed by Chuck Jones. In the cartoon, various types of musical alterations depict drunkenness. I'll explain this first before watching it. We'll hear two tunes, uh, the Blue Danube Waltz, Blue Danube Waltz uh, and Little Brown Jug. There are no immediate musical alterations in the first phrase of Little Brown Jug, but as soon as we encounter the high note for the first time, arranger Milt Franklin made immediate musical alterations, including brief dissonant interjections or hiccups by the woodwinds and percussion, a slowing of the tempo, and a seemingly stumbling accented rhythm in the percussion, which nearly align with the animation. And of course, it seems that the trombone is forever doomed to represent a drunkard. From an historical standpoint, music depictions of drunkenness have been around for a long time. Think of an opera. I don't want to generalize too much, but there's a better than decent chance that drinking occurs in that opera. <laughs> Although the reflection of that drinking in the actual music may be subtle, obvious, or non-existent. I'd like to offer at least one historical precedent for the idea of musical drunkenness, although not from an opera. Heinrich Bieber's Battaglia a Dieci from 1673. According to conductor Douglas Meyer, in the second movement, titled The Lusty Society of All Types of Humor, Bieber mixes a number of different German, Slovak, and Czech folk songs into, into a quidlibet, or which is a combining of several melodies simultaneously that don't necessarily fit together. He even notes that, uh, here it is dissonant everywhere, for thus are the drunks accustomed to bellow with different songs. Not only is he attempting to musically capture the sound of drunken singing, like we heard in The Bard's Tale, but also the environment, such as a pub, during which one might hear this sort of thing. And the entire movement's only 45 seconds long, so I'll play the entire thing.
1673. In terms of video games, I think one important component uh, to portraying musical drunkenness is the use of cultural stereotypes. Although the music itself may not depict a drunkard, the musical tropes heard in these next two examples from World of, War World, World of Warcraft draw heavily, I haven't been drinking yet, I promise, uh, draw heavily on highly stereotyped German and Chinese musical ideas. The first is the other dwarven of the Brewfest music. You heard one of these earlier, which draws heavily on German, specifically Bavarian Umpa bands. And the second is, uh, excerpt is titled Out Drunk by Chen from Mists of the uh, from the midst of Pandaria extraction. <laughs> For this topic, I certainly could see some historical, music theoretical, ethnomusicological, and compositional avenues for exploration, as, especially as representation of drunkenness certainly reach far and wide. The final topic I'd like to suggest, simulations of intoxication, is different from musical depictions of drunkenness in that I'm interested in the perceptual differences of sound that may be experienced by a listener. In other words, from a first-person perspective, how do the effects of alcohol change your hearing? It can be easy to focus on the beer goggle effects of video games, but not all of them have corresponding sound manipulations as well. If they do anything at all, there may be a brief RLQ that signifies an altered state, but this doesn't last very long. I'd like to play two examples of this. The first is from Bioshock, in which drinking alcoholic beverages create both a visual and sonic distortion. And the second is a scene from Mass Effect 2. In this scene, the voice actor has to alter his voice a little bit when the character is drunk, Furthermore, when the character Shepard falls over, his perceptions of the sounds around him change and fade as he blacks out, and he wakes up to uh, ringing in his ears. stuff in the thing where stuff goes in. Your funeral, pal. Video games that include these sound alterations may be similar to what many hearing specialists call cocktail deafness, which is a noise-induced hearing loss that can occur while drinking. This often happens in conjunction with loud music, uh, uh, with loud sounds, music, and talking in a bar or nightclub. Cocktail deafness is a temporary altered state of hearing due to the use of alcohol, similar to what we see in these scenes. And to continue with the physiological aspects of drinking and hearing for a moment, we know that long-term drinking can damage the auditory cortex and can cause permanent tinnitus. To my knowledge, no game alters sounds based on a character's long-term drinking habits, although perhaps Max Payne, a notorious drinker, should grow harder of hearing in each successive game. Also, while not a sound effect, we must remember that vertigo and balance issues as an effect of alcohol is due to alcohol being absorbed by the fluid in our inner ear. All of the stumbling that occurs after binge drinking is certainly well represented in games, and some mods, like this one in Grand Theft Auto 4, can make you drunk walk whenever you would like. So an interesting prospect for further study here might involve virtual and altered reality. A number of studies have attempted to utilize virtual reality to help those who suffer from addiction, substance abuse, or to try to simulate drunk driving. But again, the visual bias to some of these studies ignores or diminishes the role of audio, especially in how the effects of a substance may change our hearing. 
So what I presented today is only an initial, uh, an initial exploration to sounds and music related to alcohol in various forms of media. The four categories I've introduced certainly need further exploration, uh, but most of the examples I've come across uh, seem to be able to fit in, into one of the four of them. So I look forward to your thoughts and questions, and if not now, perhaps later, over a drink. <laughs> All right, the cube is over here, I believe, so we have time for a couple questions. Thanks, Peter. This is really interesting and um, you know, fun to th think about and stuff. And it was making me think of uh, a, a topic that came up in a seminar I taught this fall on disability in music. And, and one week I had them look at the Hugo Wolf um, sort of Varnung song, which is about a hangover. And, and the, the thing that I wanted to sort of throw at the class that day was the question of, of, of being drunk or being hungover and to what extent is this a disability, I mean, the impairments? I mean, the way we had defined disability and stuff up to that point, it actually left very possible that drunkenness would be a disability. And so it, it brought all these other questions into, into the discussion. But it's, it's making me think of all of this. I mean, much of what you were talking about, all this could be couched within a, a question of, you know, in what ways do the games disable the player? Are there disabling representations and stuff? So I, I think it's a really rich thing you're tapping into. And I, I don't want to, I, I could afterwards, I mean, I, I'm thinking of all the different musical depictions of drunkenness, and I don't want to start that sort of yeah. AMS thread <laughs> thing that could happen yeah. and, and snowball. But I, I think that it's just a really, really rich thing you've started here, so thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I do want to hear about other possibilities, because I, I, I could easily have streamed an hour of just examples, and then we could have discussed. So, um, but but I, I do want to hear them, and this is also the first time I've used Prezi, so I'm happy to share this with anyone. Just send me a note. I'm, I'm happy to can send you the entire presentation. That's fine. Um, but one of the things this, this makes me think of, Neil, is, um, is the status change. One of the things I, I was talking to a few other people about this and thinking about it is how, how this might be ex expanded is uh, some games have these status changes and, and how aural, uh, unique aural sounds go, go along with that. I mean, the power-up mushroom is a status change, right? So, I mean, th that, that could be something that, 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 could, that could fit into this. Of course, I, how, how specific do I get to alcohol and how broad does, do I want to try to go with it with with sort of the larger context, but uh, yeah, thank you. We're safe, <laughs> we're good. Um, so I, um, first, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I can't help but notice that um, in, the, in the music that we heard, uh, it was all pretty upbeat. You know, it, um, it seemed happy to me. Uh, maybe I just like Oompa, <laughs> but um, and, and then uh, when we when we see characters sort of becoming intoxicated, uh, it's not necessarily as happy, right? I don't know if Shepard seemed like he was having an especially good day there, <laughs> but um, you know afterwards he just kind of wakes up and he's still got both of his kidneys, and um, you know whoever he's trying to mac on hasn't left him. He's all better. In your research for this, did you run across any attempts to portray things less happily? Yeah, so um, I think the best example that I came across is the Max Payne uh, stuff, because um, he's kind of a dark character, actually. And uh, so some of the scenes of him in Max Payne 3, where he's sort of st struggling with this, and he he's drinking a lot, and there's an underscore to it. And I think it would be, again, this is very initial work, so, so I think it would be really interesting to look at that underscore, which uh, is sort of a, a reflection of, of how he's wrestling with, with himself and, and his addiction, I think. So, so, so there are definitely dark, uh, darker moments, I think, with, with uh, alcohol. And you know, one way to go with that, I think, more so would be with drug addiction, the, the times you see drug in 
uh, in video games. There, there may be darker things there, but, but you're right. I mean, whether or not um, they're just trying to make light of the fact of, of, uh, of video game sounds and, and certainly the um, musical depictions of being drunk tend to be not farcical necessarily, but uh, you're right, I think. Uh, and there's, there's maybe something to that I hadn't thought of. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Great, thank you. We will have to move on here.